Welcome back to CS111. In this lecture, we're going to look at another approach we can use for implementing data structures, working with linked chains of nodes. We're going to start off by talking a bit about nodes and how they compare to arrays. And then we're going to go and see how we can use these nodes to implement bags. So far, we've looked at how we can use arrays to implement data structures. As it turns out, in some cases, such as when we know specifically how much data we're going to need to store, arrays are actually a really good solution to that problem. Arrays store things in contiguous chunks of memory, so there's not a whole lot of overhead associated with them. If we have an array that is properly sized for how much data we're going to be storing in it, the array is actually the most efficient way we can use our memory. There's some pretty big caveats with that though, being the fact that most of the time we're not really sure how much stuff we actually need to store. In Java and a lot of other languages, arrays are created as a fixed size. Once you go and make that array, it's going to stay at that same size for the entire time that it lives. And you can run into two problems because of that. If you go and undershoot the size of your array, you're going to end up with an array that's not large enough to store all the data that you need. On the flip side though, if you go and make an array that's too large, you can end up with a lot of wasted space because all of the memory that is allocated for those elements that you're not using, that memory is still tied up and not available for other things. Trying to account for those size limitations of arrays has some pretty significant performance problems. Since we can't go and resize an existing array, if we need something that's either larger or smaller, we have to go and create a new array, and then we have to go and copy all the values that are in the first array into our second one. And this is a really inefficient process. You have to go and spend time to go and do all those copies, so that's time that the processor is just sort of doing busy work making those copies versus actually something that's really computationally useful. It also means that while we might be trying to go and save memory by using arrays and, and having relatively small ones, when we actually go and do this copying process, we need to use a lot of memory then because we have both the original array and the new larger array that at least briefly have to coexist so we can go and do that copy. So we can end up actually needing more memory here if we don't make our initial array large enough. A more flexible way for us to implement data structures is to use what's known as a node. So a node is an instantiated object of a class that we're going to call node. The node class itself is pretty simple. It really just has two fields. It's going to have a field that will store the data that we want to try to store in a node. And each node is basically going to be equivalent to one element in the array. The other field is going to keep track of where the next node in our chain is located. So what we're going to do here is basically form a chain where we can start at the first node and then keep on working our way through by going to the next node and then the next node and then the next node and get to all of the nodes and get to all of the data that we have stored. We do need to have some way of getting to the very first node which is a lot of times called the head node. But as long as we have that we can go and follow the chain between all of our other nodes to get all the values that we have stored in our data structure. One factor that's often considered when looking at different ways of storing data is how efficient it is with memory. When we're working with chains of linked nodes, every node has an actual value that's stored. We don't have any wasted space like we do see with an array. With an array, because arrays are fixed size, 
and because it's a lot of work to go and create larger arrays, we tend to end up going and making larger arrays that take up more space so that we have to go and recreate them less often. But those empty spaces within the array do take up memory. We don't have that same wasted space with nodes because if we need more memory, we just go and add a new node. If we get rid of a value, we just go and remove that node. Now, that being said, um, because of how the two different strategies work, there is an efficiency difference in terms of the amount of memory required for each individual element that we're trying to store. Nodes have a lot of extra overhead because not only are they storing the value, which an array also has to do, but they also have to go and store the location and memory of the next node. Arrays are stored in contiguous chunks of memory. They don't have all of this extra overhead to indicate where the next location is. When we're dealing with an array, the next location is just immediately after the current one. So this does mean that there's a lot more overhead associated with nodes, and in a lot of cases that extra overhead sort of will negate any practical benefit we see from going in using less memory from not having those unused uh, elements in an array. Another key difference between array-based and node-based implementations of data structure is their time complexity. When we have an array-based data structure, if we're trying to retrieve a value from any individual item that we have stored, the array allows us to go directly to that location and retrieve the value. When we're working with a node-based implementation, we don't have that ability to go directly to every single location. We can normally go to the very first node, which is generally called our head node. Sometimes we can go directly to the last node or the tail node. But to get to any of the nodes in between, we have to either go to the first or last node and then follow a chain to get to those middle nodes. And that requires more steps. So that is a case where array-based implementations tend to ha have a little bit uh, better time efficiency. Uh, this is something called big O notation, and we're going to talk about it more later in the semester. Since we have to keep track of all the links to the head node and then to all the other nodes in the chain, what we do tend to find is that implementations that use nodes are more complicated than ones that are based on arrays. There's just more bookkeeping type work to keep track of what everything is supposed to be pointing at so that our chain doesn't end up broken. But, you know, there's trade-offs with everything and having the flexibility to size whatever size we need is perhaps a worthwhile trade-off for this. Now that we've learned a bit about nodes, let's see how we can use them to go and implement a bag. We're going to create a class that uses a linked chain of nodes to implement bag interface. This design is going to give us a bag that doesn't have the capacity limits of the array-based approach. Basically, as long as there's still memory available on our system, we can continue to add items to our bag. Because of the flexibility of linked node-based approaches like this, this sort of design is commonly used when going and actually coding up data structures. Here in Eclipse, I've imported the starter code for this lecture. For us to work on our linked bag implementation, we want to create a new project. In Package Explorer, I'm going to right click and go to New Java Project, and I'm going to call this project Linked Bag. I want to make sure that the checkbox for create module info.java is unchecked because we're not trying to work with modules here, and I'm going to click Finish. In this project, we're going to make use of the bag interface that's defined in the bag interface project. We want to go and add that project to our class path so that when Java tries to compile our code, it knows it needs to go look there for things that it can't find inside of this project. So let's go and add that by right clicking on our linked bag project and going to properties. 
I want to go to the Java Build Path tab here. And you can see there's a number of tabs across the top where I can go and customize what I'm bringing in. I'm trying to use like Java compiled files that are called jars. If I'm using the Java system library, I can go and bring in different things here. We want to go to the projects tab because we're trying to bring in code from another project in our same workspace. Since we are not using modules, we're going to go and add it as a class path. So I want to click class path so that it's highlighted and then I'll be able to click the add button on the right side. When I click add, I'll see a list of the other projects that are in this workspace. I'm going to go ahead and click bag interface so that that specific project is part of the class path. It'll look there for code. Don't just go crazy and add every possible thing. It just slows down your compilation. Just go and add the specific projects that you actually need. With bag interface listed here under the class path, I'm going to tell it to apply and close. Inside of the linked bag project, I'm going to add a package to mirror what we have with our packages for our array bag implementation. This way we'll be able to go and use our linked node-based implementation in other projects in our workspace here or other places that we might want to use it. I'm going to right click on the source folder and I'll go to new package and I'm going to follow the same naming convention we've been using. We'll start off with edu.wvu.cs111 and then we'll do uh, a dot here and I'm going to call this linked bag and I'll click finish. Inside of this new package, I'm going to go and create a class called linked bag. So I'll right click on my linked bag package here. I'm going to go to new class and I'm going to name this class linked bag. We'll have a public access modifier. I want to go and list the bag interface as something that we're going to be implementing. So I'll click the add button here and in my case it's already listed here but I can search for it too and I'm going to tell it OK that I want to bring in bag interface. Notice that Eclipse has picked up on the fact that bag interface actually has a generic parameter T. It's actually showing that here. I'll leave the, tech, uh, the checkbox ticked for create method stubs for inherited abstract methods and I'm going to click finish. Now one thing that you can quickly see here is that even though I had that checkbox marked I still didn't get stubs created and that has to do in part because bag interface expects this parameter T. I want to go and provide that same parameter here on my linked bag class so that when it goes and compiles T is going to fall into all the methods that I have here but also so that it goes and passes that same T along for bag interface. So right after linked bag, I'm going to go ahead and put in some angle braces and add a T here. And once I've done that, I'm actually going to go back to where it's got the red squiggly lines under linked bag and I'm going to choose the quick fix option to add unimplemented methods. So it's going to go ahead and add all those stubs like would have been generated if we didn't have generics to mess around with. Before I go and save this class here, I'm going to add some Java doc for the linked bag class itself. So I'm going to say that this is a linked implementation of a bag. Go ahead and correct my author name. You'll notice that Eclipse added this param with the T for my generic. This is going to allow me to describe what type of generic parameter I might want to go and include here. So I'm going to say that T is the type of data to be stored in the bag. Before I go any further with implementing the fields or methods for my linked bag class, I'm going to create a class to represent 
the nodes that will actually store our individual pieces of data in the bag. Now, my node class here is going to be pretty intricately tied to linked bag. It's really just there to support the functioning of linked bag. Because of that, I'm going to actually opt to nest that class inside of linked bag. And I'm going to give it a protected access modifier. That means that I won't be able to really interact with that class outside of the context of linked bag or anything that might go and inherit from linked bag or is part of the same package. In this case here, since the nodes really aren't intended to be publicly viewable, everything that we're going to do with the bag is going to be through the methods that are on the linked bag class and the bag interface. There's no reason for me to have node be a standalone public class that others could interact with. It's better for me just to keep the exposed list of classes a little bit simpler and nesting it and making it protected does that. So what I'm going to do here is scroll down to the end of my linked bag class and I'm going to go and define my new class. So I'm going to say that this is a protected class and I'm going to call it node. I'll provide some Java doc for this class here. And this is a class to represent items stored in the bag. I don't need to go and add a generic parameter to node in order to be able to use that T generic inside of it. Since node is nested inside of linked bag, it's automatically going to inherit that T generic parameter from the parent class that it's nested inside of. So I can go ahead and just start using T inside of the node class here. My node class is going to have two fields. I'm going to make them both be protected. We're going to have one of type T, and like I said, we're inheriting that T generic. We're going to call it data. This is going to represent the data that's stored in the node. We'll also have one that's going to point to the next node in our linked chain. This is how we're going to be able to get through all the pieces of data that we have stored in our bag. This one I'll make protected. I'm going to call the type as node because that's the name of the class that we've got here. And the individual variable itself will be next node. So we're going to do some Java doc here and say that this is a link to the next node. I'm also going to provide a constructor for the node class. This will be protected to go and match the access modifier that we have on our node class itself. It's going to be called node and it's going to take two parameters, one for each of the fields that we're trying to store data for. So our first one's going to be type T, and we'll call it data. Second one's going to be of type node and it's going to be called next node. And what we're going to do is just take the value that's passed into the constructor and store it in the corresponding field. So we'll store data by saying this.data equals data. In this case here, the this prefix designates that I'm talking about the field that is part of the class. The version of data that doesn't have that prefix means that I'm dealing with the local variable inside of this method. Since I have both a field and a local variable, the this prefix gives me the ability to distinguish between the two. We're going to have the same thing when we go and store our next node. So I'm going to say this dot next node equals next node. And I'll provide some Java doc for the constructor here. So we're going to create a new node. Data is the data to store in the node and next node is the link to the next node. With the node class out of the way, let's turn our attention back to linked bag. And we're going to go ahead and define two fields to store information here. We don't have an array in our implementation here, but we do need to have some way to be able to get to our data. And that's by being able to go to the very first node in our chain. We're going to call that the head node, which is a commonly used term for that. So I'm going to go and create a protected field because I don't want it to be accessible outside of linked bag or things that might inherit from linked bag. It's going to be of type node and I'm going to call it head node. Do some Java doc for that. 
saying that this is the first node in the chain. I'm also going to go and have a protected int field called size to keep track of how many items we have in the bag. Now, strictly speaking, I could go through and find out the size by starting at the head node and then looping to iterate over that chain of nodes until I got to the end and just keep track that way. But that is actually a fairly expensive operation because I have to go and look at every single node. It's going to be more efficient for me to just have a variable that I increment and decrement as I add and remove items. That way I can just go directly there to go and find out what my size is. With the case of linked bag, when I go and create an instance, there's not really any argument that I need to provide. I don't have a, a fixed size array like I'm dealing with for the array-based implementation. I could, if I wanted to, go and rely on Java's default constructor that it goes and provides if I don't give a constructor myself. The default constructor does not take any parameters and essentially the only thing it does is it just goes and sets the fields to their default values. In the case of a number, that's zero, so size would be set to zero. And in the case of a reference type, that's null. So head node would be set to null. That's actually all I really need to do for this class. So I could omit a constructor entirely. In this case though, I am going to go and provide a constructor. And some of that is just kind of personal style. Uh, when I get into more complex classes, a lot of times I like to have a constructor there. Uh, if it's a, you know just something that just has one or two fields, I, I might think about omitting it there. But um, the other reason why I'm going to go through and include this is because it gives me a chance to sort of document with code this is specifically the behavior that I'm expecting. I want to make sure that if I have a new bag or a bag that doesn't have anything, that head node is null because that means that there's nothing in my chain. I want to make sure that when I go and create a new bag, the size is zero because that means I'm not storing anything. So going and providing the constructor is going to give me a convenient way to go and kind of document that behavior. I'll create the constructor here as a public method for its access modifier. It's going to be called linked bag, and it's not going to take any parameters, so I just have an empty set of parentheses. We're going to go through and initialize head node to null as nothing is in the chain yet. And so I'm just going to say this.headNode equals null. And then we'll go and initialize our node counter to zero as well. So this.size is going to be set to zero just to signify that you know there is nothing being stored. And I'll go ahead and provide some Java doc. So it's a constructor for a new bag of linked nodes. Okay, now we're ready to go and start implementing our methods here. As we work through this class, there aren't going to be any of the helper methods that we created for the array-based implementation. With the way the nodes work here, the behavior is going to be specific enough for each of the individual methods that there's not going to be this sort of internal chunk of code that I'm going to want to be able to reuse like I did with the helper methods for the array-based implementation. I'm just going to basically code everything inside of the methods that are defined in the interface. To start off, let's work on our add method. I'm going to get rid of the auto-generated stub code here. Now, in working with a the bag, there are no presuppositions about how things are actually going to be ordered. I can go and store items in the bag whichever way is most convenient for me. In our case here, that's going to be to make whichever item is most recently added be the head node. And then anything that's been added previously will come after it in the chain. By going and designing our implementation this way, it means there's less code that we have to go and write. And it's also going to be a little bit more efficient to go and actually run. If I were to go and say that, you know, for example, the most recently added item would be at the end of the chain of nodes, I'd have to go and loop over that entire chain of nodes to go and add something new. That takes extra time. 
So I want to be able to avoid that. And since there's no requirements about the order, I'm just going to do whichever is most convenient for me. Inside the add method here, we want to go and create a new node. And this one's going to serve as the head of our chain. So we're going to create a new node for head of the chain. And what I'm going to do is go and have that new node as its next node point at the existing head node. And that's going to make sure that we still have access to all the other values that we're already storing. So I'm going to use the var keyword here to do some type inference. I'll say var new node equals new node. So I'm going to call that constructor. The constructor for our node class took two arguments. The first one is going to be the value that we're trying to store, so that's going to be item. The second argument is going to be what the next node is supposed to be in the chain after this node. And here we're going to say this dot head node. If this is the very first node in our chain, head node is going to be null, which will just signify there's nothing else that's going to come after it in the chain. If there was already something in the chain, it's just going to get bumped so that it comes after this new node that we're making. So this code is going to work whether or not there's actually anything in the chain already. With other data structures, things have to be more complex. Sometimes we have to go and differentiate between those cases. But here with the bag, we don't have to. We can get away with this. Once we've gone and created that new node, we're going to go through and update our head node pointer to go and point at that new node. So I'm going to say this dot head node is equal to new node. So our new node is now the head of the chain, and anything that was there before is now going to come after that new node. I want to make sure that I update the size field so I can keep track of how many items we have stored. So I'll do this dot size plus plus. And then the last thing I'm going to do is go through and return true. Because our interface defines this method as having a Boolean return value, I do need to actually go and return something. When we were working with our array-based implementation, you know, we had that risk that we couldn't go and add things because our array was full. So the true-false return value options there were useful. Here, they're not quite as useful because I can always go and allocate another node and just keep building things up that way as long as there's more memory available in my system. If my computer has run out of memory, that's probably a bigger problem than I want to tackle. So if there's an exception that gets thrown from that, I'm just going to let that exception happen. I'm not going to try to catch it or anything like that. We're going to assume that if this code has run, that we were successful in adding the item, and for that, we're returning true. Next, let's take a look at our isEmpty method. So this one should return true when there is nothing stored. In our case, there's actually two different things that can signify there's nothing stored. If there is nothing being stored, our head node field should point at null. We also have that size field that we're incrementing and decrementing as we go. Assuming that I've implemented everything correctly once this is all done, if head node is null and size is zero, those should always occur together and only together. I can go and theoretically check either one to figure out if our bag is empty, or I could actually check both of them together. For my implementation here, I'm going to go and check to see if head node is null. So I'm actually just going to do this as a one-liner. We'll just write a line of comment, though. Uh, determine if nothing is in the chain. And I'm going to go through and return the value that gets from evaluating the expression this dot head node is equal equal to null. So if the head node is null, that should signify that there is nothing being stored. If there is anything being stored, we have no way to get to it in that case. In this sort of scenario, I tend to prefer looking for things that could potentially be null rather than counters just because if later I was trying to go and 
access head node, I want to make sure that it's not null first, uh, because if I try to go through and access something that turns out to be null, I'll get a null pointer exception. So here, I'd rather go through and check head node rather than size, just to avoid that risk of null pointer exception if something else is relying on is empty and I didn't implement things correctly. As long as I did it correctly though, it's not really a problem either way. If I do this or check the size. Let's continue on and work on the version of the remove method that doesn't take any parameters. So this one is just going to take something from the bag and go ahead and return it. There's no expectation about what specific item we're going to go and remove. That's really sort of up to us how we want to go and implement this. For my implementation here, I'm going to go and take the item that is currently the head node. And kind of for the same reason why I went and chose to insert at the head node end of things with add, I'm going to go through and remove at that end here. It's something that's quick and easy for me to do. I can go directly to that head node and pretty easily with one more jump to the node after it. I don't have to go and loop through my entire chain of nodes like if I was, for example, trying to go and remove from the tail end of my linked chain of nodes. This is going to give me better performance and it's a little bit simpler for me to code. Inside of my remove method here, the first thing that I want to do is actually check to see that there is something to go and remove. What I'm going to do here is return null if my bag is empty. So that's part of the reason why we don't want to allow nulls to be stored in the bag because it'll cause confusion here. I need to go and check to see if there's actually something in the bag. For this here, I'm going to go and do the same test that I did up in is empty. I'm going to see if this dot head node is equal equal to null. And if it is, I'm going to go and return null. The reason why I'm specifically coding for head node is equal to null here, rather than say calling is empty, um, is kind of a, a personal preference, but it's just a, a case here where I want to really make sure that head node is not null before I go and try to access any of the methods involving it before I go and dereference it. If I go and call is empty, as I have it coded right now, it is definitely going to check head node. But I don't necessarily know that is empty might not change in the future. That would especially be the case if is empty was in some other class entirely where I couldn't see its source code. So just kind of a safety thing here is that that's why I'm going and checking head node specifically. Once we know that there's actually something in the bag that we can go and remove, we're going to go and get that item. What I'm going to do here is create a variable that is just going to allow us to keep track of the current head node in our chain here. And I'm going to go and call this variable remove node, and I'm going to set it equal to this dot head node. What's going to happen here is in this next line of code I'm going to go and write, I am going to go and update our head node pointer to point at the second node. Once that happens, I can't use head node to get to the original head node. It's going to point at the one after it. And the way my nodes are set up, there's no way to go backwards. I can only go forwards in the list. So by having removed node existing, I'll still be able to get to that one. I'm going to go here and say that this dot head node is equal to remove node dot next node. So we're kind of bypassing the node that we're going to get rid of. I want to go and decrement my counter to reflect that we now have a fewer number of items stored. So I'm going to do this dot size minus minus. And then I want to go and return the value from the node that we're removing. I'm not returning the node itself. I'm removing, turning the value from the data field inside of it. I never actually want to expose the node class or its objects to anything outside of my linked bag class. So I'm going to return removed node.data. With the no parameter version of remove out of the way, let's work on the one where we actually specify the item we would like to remove. I'm going to start off here by getting rid of the auto-generated code stub. 
And the first thing that we're going to do inside of this method is iterate over the items that are in our chain of linked nodes until we hopefully find the one that we're looking for. So what I'm going to do here is set up a loop to go and do that iteration. But first, I need to create a variable to keep track of my position. I'm going to create this var here that I'm going to call current node. And I'm going to set it equal to this dot head node, which will be the very beginning of my linked chain of nodes. I'm going to have a while loop that's going to serve to do the searching. I'm going to loop while two conditions are both true. While current node is not equal to null, and so I've got two ampersands there, while the data that's stored in our current node is not what we're searching for. So I'm going to go and put an exclamation point here to go and flip true and false based on the value I'm going to get back from the equals method here in a moment. So I'm saying while not uh, current node dot data dot equals item. And inside the body of this loop, we're going to go ahead and move to the next node. So I'm saying here current node equals current node dot next node. The way this is going to work here is that as long as current node is still pointing at a node that actually exists and that node that we are currently looking at is not the one that we're searching for, we're going to move on down to check the next node. Eventually, we're going to run into one of two circumstances happening. Either we'll get to the point where we have exhausted all of the nodes and we haven't found the one we're looking for. In that case, current node will be null. Or we actually find the node that we're looking for, in which case current node.data will equal the item. And this is going to go through and get us out of the loop as well. Now, assuming that there is nothing that's in our chain here, this dot head node is going to be null, so this loop is never going to run because it's not going to satisfy this condition. If somebody were to go and specify null as the value to search for, this is still going to work okay with my call to equals. It's just going to be a matter that it will never find the item, so it will eventually will exhaust all the items. Now, I could have chosen to go and kind of bypass the case where somebody went and passed null and just get right out of that method, and that's not necessarily a bad approach to take, uh, just to go and write an if statement at the very beginning that goes and looks to see if item is equal to null, or maybe even go and check if the head node is null. In which case, for both of those, you know, the item that we want isn't going to be present, so we could just return false. Sometimes it makes sense to go and kind of bypass with early out things like that. Here, I'm opting for slightly simpler code. I'm just going to go in and handle things through the normal process of operations rather than having that separate if statement. But there's nothing wrong with going through and including that. And sometimes depending on what sort of operations you expect to actually see most frequently, it might make sense to go and kind of have that early out. But I'm going to leave that out from my implementation here. Once we've fallen out of the loop, we have one of two circumstances. Either we found the item we're looking for, or we've run out of places to look and we couldn't find it. We need to have an if statement to go and figure out which case we're dealing with. So we're going to check to see here if the current node is or is not null. If the current node is not null, we found the item. So my if statement here is going to see if current node is not null. If current node is not null, we've actually found the item that we're trying to remove. Now, the way I'm going to code this here is I'm not actually going to directly remove the node that contains the value that we want to get rid of. What I'm going to do is actually swap values around. And the reason why I'm doing this is that with our chain of nodes here, we're only able to go in one direction. We can only go forwards. 
we can't go backwards and that's going to make it really hard to go and delete a node from the middle of our chain it's going to be a lot easier just to keep that node in place and change its value it could be doable if I really wanted to delete it but there would be some more logic more work involved for my implementation here what I'm going to do is swap its value of the node that I'm removing with the one from the head and then I'll just get rid of the head because that is pretty easy to go and do so here we're going to go and replace the value stored in current node with the contents of head node so I'm going to change the actual data that we're storing itself current node dot data equals this dot head node dot data then I'm going to go and remove the old head node just like we did with the version of remove that doesn't take any parameters I'm going to say this dot head node is going to point at the node that comes after the existing head here I'm going to go and say that's going to be equal to this dot head node dot next node I'm not bothering with creating a removed node variable like I did there because I'm not actually interested in the value that's in the head node anymore there's no reason for me to keep access to it I just want to go and update things here uh, to go and bypass it once I've gone and removed the item I'm gonna go and decrement my counter for the number of items stored do this dot size minus minus and I'm gonna go ahead and return true for a successful removal I want to handle the case here where current node is null and that's gonna mean that we could not find the item and we're gonna return false for that so this will take care of all the different scenarios that we might encounter when we're trying to go and remove a specific item from our bag I'll continue on and do the cleared method next for this implementation here I'm gonna set it up so that we just loop as long as there is stuff in the bag and each time I'm just gonna remove one item by calling the version of the remove method that doesn't take any parameters that's gonna ensure that things get cleaned up nicely versus me trying to shortcut stuff a little bit here inside the clear method I'm gonna go and loop to remove all items and what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna go and say while it is not is empty I'm going through and using the is empty method here rather than checking for head node because I don't have to worry about a null pointer potentially coming about from head node here because I'm not gonna actually use that field in this method and going through and checking for is empty seems a little bit more obvious about what I'm doing than checking for if head node is null so that's that's why I'm choosing to implement this this way but with a lot of things with programming there's multiple ways that you can do things and still get the same result so we're gonna go ahead and remove any one item here by calling this dot remove and we're just gonna keep on calling that until we've removed everything my size method is going to be really straightforward I'm just going to go through and return the value of the size field so I'm just going to return this dot size for my count of implementation I'm going to have to iterate over each of the nodes in the chain to see if it matches the value I'm looking for to start off here I'm going to go ahead and create a counter variable so I can keep track of how many times I've seen the item I'm going to call this occurrences it's going to be an int and I'll initialize it to zero next what I want to do is go and iterate through the chain to look for the item for this here I'll create this var called current node and I'm going to set it to the head node so I start at the beginning of my chain and I'm going to go and loop while current node is not null so this is going to take me through all of the nodes if it turns out there are no nodes then this loop is not going to run at all but for each actual valid node that we run across here we're gonna go and see if it matches the value we're looking for so we'll increment the count if the item is found and we're gonna see if we found the item using an if statement I'm gonna say here current node dot data dot equals item 
if that is true, then we've found the item. And I'll go ahead and increment my occurrences variable. I'll go ahead and get out of that if statement. Inside the while loop here, I want to go and advance on to the next node. And I'm going to do that by saying current node equals current node dot next node. Once we get out of the while loop, we're all done with our search. So we can just go ahead and return occurrences. Contained is going to be pretty similar to count of, except that rather than going and incrementing a counter, we'll just go and return true if we find the item. This way we don't have to keep iterating over the entire chain of nodes if we actually find the item. So we're going to iterate through chain to look for item. And I'm going to do the same thing with creating a var called current node as I did before. So I'm saying current node is equal to this dot head node and while current node is not null we're gonna go and investigate. We want to see if the item was found and we'll do that by seeing if current node dot data dot equals is equal to our item. If we found the item though we're just going to go and return true. We're going to get out of the loop. There's no need for us to go and check anything more because all we want to know is did we find the item at least once. Getting out of that if statement, if we're at this point here, that means we did not find the item in our current node. And we're going to go and advance to the next node. So we're going to say current node equals current node dot next node. If we get out of the loop, that means that we did not find the item. So we had all items checked without a match and we'll return false in this case to denote that the value was not found in our bag. To wrap things up with our linked bag class, let's go and implement the methods to export the contents of the bag to an array. I'm going to start off with the version that creates an array of objects. Now this one's going to be uh, quite a bit more complex than the same method in the array based implementation and that's because we don't already have an object array. I can't just go and call arrays.copy. So I've got to go and make a new array and then I can go and populate it with the values from the bag by going over our chain of linked nodes. Let's start off by going and creating our new array. So I'm going to say var destination array equals new object and the size of the array is going to be the same size of the number of elements I have. So this dot size. Once I have that made, I'm going to go and iterate over our nodes one by one to go and copy their contents into the array. I'm going to go and implement this as a while loop. I know how many items I should have, um, but what we're actually going to do for our test here is going to go through and loop while current node is not null. So for that, I'm kind of leaning towards a while I think is a better approach. I do need to have some variables to keep track of things, especially since I can't go and put them in the parentheses for a for loop. I'm going to go ahead and create this variable that I'm going to call index and I'm going to go and set it to zero. This is going to keep track of what element we're currently populating in the array. I'm going to go in and make current node to keep track of my position in going through our chain of nodes. And initially it's going to start off set to the head node. Once I have those in place, I can go and do my while loop. And I'm actually going to have two different conditions that are going to have to be true for us to keep looping here. I'm going to say while current node is not null, which means that the current node actually is a valid node, and index is less than destination array dot length. That's just to make sure that for some reason if things got out of sync with size here that we don't go and 
try to copy more items than we actually have spaces for in our array. Shouldn't happen, but it's an easy safety check just to go and build in. Inside the loop here, what I'm gonna do is store the value of the current node in our destination array. So I'm gonna say destination array sub index, or that's the IDX, is equal to current node dot data. Make sure that you copy the data field and not the entire node itself for this. Once I've done that copy, I wanna go and increment my counter so IDX plus plus, so that when I copy the next value, it's gonna go in its own element. And then I'm gonna go and move to the next node. So I'll say current node equals current node dot next node. Eventually, I'll get to the point where the next node is null, and at that time, we're gonna go and follow out of the loop. Once we get out of that loop, we're done. So we can go ahead and return our destination array. The version of toArray that returns an array of our generic type is going to be kind of a combination of what we did for this method in the array-based implementation with what we did with the other version of toArray in this linked bag implementation. The first part is going to be where we're going to have to look at the array that got passed in. And we need to figure out if it's big enough to store all of the items that we have. If not, we're gonna to have to make a bigger array. So for our test here, we're gonna see if destination array, which is the array that was passed in, is smaller than the size of our bag, then we're gonna to have to go and create a new larger array. We wanna make sure that our array has the same type as the array that got passed in. So for that, I'm gonna go and use the copy of method in the arrays class. I'm gonna go ahead and just replace the existing array. So I'm gonna say destination array equals java.util.arrays.copy of, and I'm gonna go and pass it as its first argument the existing array, because that's the array we're trying to copy. And I'm going to go and pass as a second argument this.size. So that's gonna go and make that new array be of the size we need. Assuming that we don't need to make a new array, we do wanna ensure that we've initialized all the values in the existing one. So that if it's an element that we aren't gonna be using, that'll be null in case the array that we're given is actually larger than what we need. And that's gonna go in my else clause. So I'm gonna go through here and say java.util.arrays, and I'm gonna go and use the fill method here. For this one, I need to go and specify which array I'm gonna go and fill, and that's gonna be destination array, and I have to say what value I'm filling it to, and that's gonna be null. Just add a comment here. Add a comment for this one here too. And so now we've got an array and we're ready to go ahead and populate it with the data from our bag. And this is basically gonna be the exact same code that we had created up above. So I'm gonna go and create this int that I'm gonna call IDX to keep track of what array element we're looking at here. I'm gonna go and say that I've got current node to keep track of my position, and I'm gonna initialize it to head node. And we're gonna loop while current node is not null, and, so I've got two ampersands there, our index is less than the size of our destination array, which it should always be, but that prevents in case we have any problems where like size didn't get updated correctly. Inside, I'm gonna go ahead and store our value. I'm gonna go and say that destination array sub IDX is equal to current node dot data. Here, we'll say that we're gonna store value of current node in destination array. We'll increment our counter. So I'm gonna do IDX plus plus, 
and then we're going to go and move to the next node. So for that, it's going to be current node equals current node dot next node. And eventually, once we run out of nodes, node will be null, and we'll get out of our loop. And when that happens, we're going to go and return destination array to finish things up. Now that our linked bag class is done, let's go ahead and actually make use of it. I'm going to go to the bag demo project that was part of the starter code. And if we go into the main class there, you can see that right now it's going and using array bag to store these values. We're going to switch this out so that it uses linked bag instead. In order to do that, I need to first adjust the build path for my project. We're going to have to add our linked bag project to the class path there. I'm going to right click on bag demo and go to properties. And here under class path, right now you can see that our code has access to things from the array bag and bag interface projects. I'm going to go ahead and click the add button and I'm going to check the box for linked bag. I can keep array bag but since we're actually going to change our code so we're not going to be using that anymore I'm actually going to remove it and then I'll click apply and close to apply these changes. I want to go ahead now and change my code so that it's going to use linked bag rather than array bag. There's two changes I'm going to have to make for this. The first one is I'm going to have to actually import that new class. So I'm going to go back to my import statement here and we're not going to be importing array bag anymore because we're not going to use it. So I'm just going to go and cut that back to edu.wvu.cs111 dot and we're going to use linked bag and I could bring in everything or I can tell it specifically I want to use the linked bag class. Down here on line 8 where I'm going and instantiating a bag instead of doing new array bag I'm going to change it to say new linked bag. And that's the only change other than, you know, importing things here that I actually have to make to go and change the backend concrete implementation I'm using for my bag. They share the same interface, they both go and implement that interface. So as long as I stick to the methods that are specified at the interface and I'm pretty well tied to that since I'm saying that bag is of type bag interface. I can just go ahead and swap them out like that. So if I go and run my code now, you can see it works. Same as the other code worked with the ray bag too, but I didn't have any other major coding or anything I had to do. I just had to make that simple substitution. And now we're using our new linked bag class. For this lecture's participation project, I want you to download the starter code that I have provided in eCampus it's going to be based on the code that we created here in this lecture. I want you to modify the linked bag class so that it does two things. One of them is that I want you to restrict the generic types that it's going to allow so it will only go and work with ones that inherit from or extend number. So that means our generic types when we actually go and create an instance of this class are gonna have to be numeric values. I can do like integer or double, something like that, uh, but I couldn't store a string for example. The other thing that I want you to do is to go into the linked bag class and create an additional method. This method is not going to be in the interface, it's going to be something that will be specific to linked bag. And I want you to go and create this method to return the average of the numbers that are stored in the bag return the values, don't print them. For this, you don't need to actually create a main class or anything that goes and instantiates the updated linked bag. I just want to see your updated class. Although if you want to create um, updated main to go and work with this and to test things, that's fine too. That's where we're going to end things for now with bags. If you have any questions, join our Q&A session or send me an email. Thanks and have a great day.